Hello, welcome to Convergent Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm very happy to bring the conversation I had with Vladimir Hamid Troyansky. Vladimir is Assistant Professor of Global Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He has his PhD in History from Stanford University and was postdoc fellow at Columbia University. His main interest areas are in global migration, forced displacement, and he has expertise in the Ottoman and Russian empires and their successor states. He is the author of the absolutely magnificent book, Empire of Refugees, North Caucasian Muslims, and the Late Ottoman State. I greatly enjoyed that book. I was I came across my radar um, early last year, actually, and um, I was able to get him to come on, and I was able to read the book, and we... We have a really nice conversation for um, a solid two hours on a history that gets overlooked, but I think a history that's very, very important for the region and definitely for, I think, global history. And so he's 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 done a great work with this book, and, and I know he's continuing to do uh, awesome work. So he's 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 just fantastic. Uh, in the conversation, we talk about uh, the landscape of the Caucasus, the Ottoman Empire, Russian Empire in the middle nineteenth century. So this is where the, the book kind of takes place. Um, we talk about the diversity of ethnic groups in the Caucasus. Uh, we talk about specifically Circassians. They, they get a lot of airplay, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of time in the book, which is uh, wonderful. Very, very fascinating uh, group. We talk about the Ottoman Empire as a land of refugees. Um, we talk about what uh, caused them to, the, many people in the Caucasus, to leave during this period, mostly because of the ethnic cleansing committed by the Russian Empire at the time. We talk about the term muhajir, why that's important, what that signifies, what it represents. We talk about the four mi uh, major migrations from the Caucasus. The Ottoman Empire is a refugee regime. Um, some of the important laws that were there and the Refugee Commission. Talk about refugees going to the Balkan region. Talk about Ottoman slavery and how very complex that is or was. We talk about Circassians going to the Levant, especially with the importance of Amman and how that um, continues to be very important. We talk about Circassians in central Anatolia. Uh, we talk about return migrations and many more topics. Um, again, I was greatly looking forward to this conversation. Um, he was, Vladimir was so kind with his time, his energy, his knowledge, and, uh, I'm very, very pleased with how the conversation turned out and, uh, really just, uh, for, for some folks that are familiar with, uh, this history, hopefully this will be, uh, uh hopefully, a, a a nice, a nice, uh, conversation for them to listen to. And for many of you that are unfamiliar with this history, I hope that, uh, it inspires you to get out there and, uh, and buy his book, Empire of Refugees. It's fantastic. As always, you can find this conversation and all other conversations at convergingdialogues.substack.com. I'm also on YouTube. So if you if you like this episode, uh, go check out some of the uh, the other episodes I have. I have many episodes there and and many similar themes and lots of different topics. And so it's uh, it's always wonderful to subscribe and like and follow and share with your friends and contribute if you like. Um, all of that's always uh, awesome to to see. And uh, now I bring you Vladimir Hamid Tryansky. I am here with Vladimir Hamid Tryansky. Uh, Vladimir, thanks so much for uh, coming on the podcast. I'm uh, greatly looking forward to speaking with you. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I was telling you before we got on that I was uh, really, really excited about your book. I, I came across it um, uh, or mid of last year, and um, I was able to, to get it from uh, the wonderful Stanford University Press. And I have inhaled your book, and it is absolutely magnificent. And um, I know it's uh, uh, just released uh, here in February of 2024. And um, so I'm excited to talk with you all about it. Uh, the book is called Empire of Refugees, North Caucasian Muslims and the Late Ottoman State. It's a great title. And it's got a, I mean, absolutely beautiful cover as well. 
Uh, it's a gorgeous it's, cover. It's really... Many thanks to Stanford University Press yeah. and many thanks to the artist yeah. who lent their original art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. And Absolutely. Like, it's, it's, it's quite beautiful. It it's definitely stands out. So, uh, so we're going to talk all about it. Uh, before we do, why don't you tell listeners uh, kind of who you are uh, professionally, academically, and, um, and uh, how you came to, I guess, you know, write the book and what you're currently, uh, what you're currently up to. Uh, of course. So I, um, and again, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm a historian of migration and displacement. Mm. My regional specialization is the uh, Middle East and the Caucasus. Mm. And I am assistant professor of um, global studies uh, at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Mm. And this is my first book. Mm. Uh, it's, um, it's a result of a dissertation that I defended at Stanford in 2018. And the interest in this topic uh, came from study abroad that I did many years ago as an undergraduate student. I did my undergraduate degree in Scotland. I was studying Arabic and international relations. So I didn't start as a historian. Uh, and I spent a year studying Arabic in Syria and in Egypt. Mm. So that was before the Arab Spring. And it was really when I was living in Damascus, when I first heard about the Circassian diaspora mm. living there mm. and about the Chechen diaspora mm. and the Dagestani diaspora. Mm. So I had some idea about the violence in the Caucasus in the 19th century and uh, migrations, but it was only in Syria when I started realizing the many legacies of migrations from the 19th century um, and the impact of those migrations on the contemporary Arab world in Turkey. And that's how I got interested in the in the histories mm. of the Middle East and the Balkans on one hand, and of the Caucasus and the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union on the other hand, and how we can connect them. Mm. So then I started my uh, PhD studies, uh, and um, the, the choice of the topic came uh, relatively organically. I wanted to kind of connect those two regions and to look at those migrations uh, more closely. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's wonderful. It's, it's such a nice... Uh kind of way of kind of observing the world around you and being like, well, how, how, how do these things happen? So I think it's not going to be a surprise to a lot of people, especially for people from those uh, nation states, as we should say, um, that, you know, there's a lot of uh, ethnic groups that are in many, many parts of the world and many of these countries as you're listing in Syria, um, you know, in Turkey, even Egypt. Um, but it's interesting to know, at least more recently or in modern times, how did some of these ethnic groups get there? Some of them have been there for many, many hundreds of years, but some of them have been more newer uh, migrations. And so that's, you know, this becomes, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, obviously, you know, pros and cons you know, kind of on both sides, obviously for, for, for many things, but to have that kind of uh, recency of it, right? So you, you, you kind of, in the book, dump us into uh, kind of the, 1850s into the 1870s and up to World War One, so very, very recent in terms of you know, I mean, obviously Egypt and Syria have very, very long histories, millennia, <laughs> so it's very, very recent history for them. Um, so I guess, what is it about this period that you wanted to focus on? I mean, obviously there's, you know, migration uh, movements, but what was it in particular, maybe in, in doing the research? That you were able to say, okay, these are the more recent migrations, or these are the ones where they these certain groups, whether it's Circassians or others, that uh, first kind of arrived in these these uh, areas. What was it about this period that uh, kind of you know pulled you to kind of start there and, and spend time there? So yeah, the book is about a massive refugee crisis that is happening in the Ottoman Empire, and uh, the refugee crisis starts in the 1850s and 1860s. And it doesn't really end. Like we can think about mm. late Ottoman history, so from the mid 19th century all the way until World War I and like 1923, we can think of this period as just the, the age of displacement, mm. where many populations are on the move and the demographics of the Middle East, including Anatolia, um, is transformed. So for me, I was interested in capturing this moment mm. of. Um, of migration policies in the Ottoman Empire becoming something else. I was interested in capturing how the Ottomans were thinking about refugees and migrants um, 
and constructing uh, what I'm calling the refugee regime. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's 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 very nicely to kind of give a little bit of the the timing of it. So let's give a little bit more context here. So um, again, I, I've talked about a little bit here on the on the podcast, but just as a kind of re- a refresher, and we can kind of give a little bit uh, of a more of an environment here. So the big the big kind of um, uh, place here is the Ottoman Empire, which you can maybe just kind of tell us in this time frame. So late Ottoman. Uh, so I mean, see, listeners will know that you know the Ottoman Empire was for six hundred plus years, uh, ending roughly around World War One, um, and and so six hundred years plus beh- uh, uh, before that. So a very very long time, uh, continuous, mm-hmm. uh, very large empire, very fascinating. Uh, some terrible dark chapters, but there's some interesting chapters there as well. Um, so just yeah, give us what what was the kind of contours or the reach of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, obviously, a lot of it is going to be in Istanbul, which is modern-day Turkey and central Anatolia, mm-hmm. but it goes into Syria and it goes into, um, you know, the the um, into places like Bulgaria and Romania and it goes, you know, mm-hmm. all the way into uh, the Caucasus regions. So tell us about the Ottoman Empire at this period, kind of just set it up, you know, set the table for us. Mm-hmm. And then also with Russia as well. Russia was also okay. another... Uh, kind of big empire, if you will, and and what was going on there. So we have two massive empires at this time, right? Russia and the Ottoman Empire. And by the mid-19th century, they both are very close to their largest territorial extent ever. The Ottoman Empire already started losing territories in the Balkans since the 18th century, and Russia hasn't yet occupied everything it will in Central Asia right? It was the late 19th century. But so here's what we have. The Ottoman Empire rules over much of the Balkans, except Greece, Mm. entire Anatolia, which is modern-day Turkey, the Levant, which is today Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, and Israel, also over Iraq, parts of the Arabian Peninsula, and parts of North Africa. Mm -hmm. And the Russian Empire, again, a massive territory, uh, all the way from Poland, through Ukraine, into Urals, Siberia, and to the Pacific Ocean. Mm, mm. So now let's focus on the Caucasus, right, where this refugee crisis begins. Mm. So in the Caucasus, so think about the Caucasus Mountains right there, territories south of the mountains, which today are three independent republics of Mm -hmm. Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, Mm -hmm. they're already part of the Russian Empire by the mid-19th century, whereas many regions north of the mountains, which is now the North Caucasus within today's Russian Federation. Some of those territories are not yet occupied by Russia. Mm. And the Caucasus war is raging on. Mm. By 1864, the Caucasus war will come to an end. And Russia waged this war against indigenous communities in the North Caucasus for the control of the entire region. The war was incredibly brutal. And in the last stages of that war, Um, the Russian army perpetrated Mm. an ethnic cleansing Mm. and many Muslims, indigenous communities in the North Caucasus, they fled the Ottoman Empire. Mm. This is the general historical, uh, the historical setup for the story. Mm. So in only two years, between 1863 and 1865, up to half a million Circassians, uh, Western Circassians, became refugees. And it was up to 90% of the entire Western Circassian population. Mm. So this moment, it's very important in both Russian and Ottoman histories. Mm. It's one of the largest displacements um, in Russian imperial history. And for the Ottomans, it was the largest refugee crisis that they had experienced until then, when they received up to half a million people in their ports within two years. Mm. Yeah, Yeah, that's that's, that's absolutely horrendous. And, and, it's interesting. I mean, obviously, I'm sure for historians, there's a larger you know historical context, which we'll, we'll kind of just say for, for, for historians properly of sorts. But the fact that there's all of these uh, different uh, ethnic groups. So this might be a little bit um, unfamiliar for some, for some people. So there are a lot of ethnic groups in the Caucasus regions, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's Circassians, which we'll get on in, about in a minute. Mm-hmm. There's, you know, Chechnyans. There's, in, in the book, you mentioned that um, there's, there's all these different uh, ethnic groups. I mean, in this, two questions. One, what, mm-hmm. what kind of, 
you know, as, as much as we know, how many ethnic groups are we talking about in the North Caucasus regions? And why do we feel there's so many in this region? Is there, is there a reason of there's a kind of one group is in one area and then they splinter off or there's things like, you know, this is not nation states against nation states. This is kind of sounds like ethnic groups. So how, how did, right. how did there become such a linguistic and ethnic diversity in this region? Right. The ethnic and linguistic diversity in the Caucasus is astounding. Yeah. In the late, in the medieval Arab world, the Caucasus was known as the mountain of tongues, ah. right? Because <laughs> there are just so many languages. There. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, let me break down mm. uh, this diversity. Again, let's look south of the mountains, right? So in the South Caucasus, the largest groups are Georgians, Armenians, and Azerbaijanis, mm -hmm. the largest ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. We can also find Abkhazians in the South Caucasus. And Abkhazians, they are ethnically closer to Circassians and Abkhazians who live to their north, mm. right? Now, in the North Caucasus, there are more different ethnic groups. So if we're looking from west to east, so from the Black Sea towards the Caspian Sea, mm -hmm. moving across the mountains, six big ethnic groups. First, it's Circassians. And in, Ru in the Russian Federation today, they are categorized as several ethnic groups, and they have three different autonomous republics. Mm. Then there are Balkars and Karachais, mm. who also have autonomous republics, and they share their two autonomous republics, kabardino balkaria and karachai Circassia, with two different groups of Circassians. Then there are Setians, mm. the Ingush, and the Chechens. Mm. And then when we get to the Caspian Sea coast, we have the Republic, the Autonomous Republic of Dagestan. Mm -hmm. And in Dagestan, you have over 30 different ethnic groups. Uh. So uh, these are some of the oldest Muslim communities mm -hmm. in Russia, um, dating back to the seventh century. Russia's oldest city is in Dagestan, Russia's oldest mosques in Dagestan. So the diversity in Dagestan alone is just absolutely incredible. Uh. So that's a snapshot of ethnic diversity. Now, let me just briefly talk about the languages. Mm -hmm. Most languages in the region belong to four different language families. There's the Northwest Caucasian language family, which is unique to the region. Mm -hmm. uh, and for example, Circassian is, uh, belongs to that family. Mm -hmm. Then there's the Northeast Caucasian language family. As you may guess, it's also unique to the region, mm -hmm. right? Chechen and English belong to that family. Mm -hmm. Then, of, then there's the Indo-European language family to which most European languages belong. And in the Caucasus, there's Ossetian, hmm. which is part of that family. And also, of course, Russian and Ukrainian, yeah. uh, which are the languages spoken by uh, immigrant communities uh, that mostly came in the 19th and 20th century to the region. Hmm. And then there are Turkic languages as well, like Nogai Tatar, Balkar, and Karachai. Hmm. These languages share some similarities with Turkish and Azerbaijan. Mm. So the diversity is amazing. And partially, it's because it is a very mountainous region. So if we look at the region through Google Maps, some villages might appear geographically closer with each other. But in reality, they'll be separated by all kinds of, you know, impenetrable mountain valleys. And people were developing and people were living their lives in isolation for centuries. So, um, yeah, and they would be somewhat close to each other geographically, but would speak completely different languages. And sometimes some languages in Dagestan would only be spoken in three or four villages mm. and nowhere else in the world. Mm. And so when we, when we think about the migrations and displacements, they're often studied as migrations of specific ethnic groups. So the migration of Circassians, the migration of Chechens, like that's how the literature is often set up. Mm. And my book, is an overview of displacement from the entire region, right? It allows me to tell a bigger story um, about displacement from the Caucasus, but also about how the Russians and the Ottomans were managing migrations and how refugees from the region, how they formed the North Caucasian diaspora already in exile in the Ottoman Empire, how they had to overcome all those cultural and linguistic differences to uh, to form one whole and amplify their voices mm. in the Ottoman Empire. Mm. It's very, it's very interesting. Obviously, we're, we're going to come to the Ottoman Empire in a minute. Um, 
I guess the the one uh, uh, focus I want to have here for just a brief second is there's a lot of different ethnic groups here, but one of the biggest uh, is Circassians. You spend a lot of time in in the book about right. Circassians. Uh, let me see if I get this right. I think this is from the book. Is that Circassians are the second largest diaspora in Turkey today after the Kurds with two to three million people. And you also explain that Circassians, there's a name in which they they themselves call themselves, but that there's 12 distinct communities. You made a, a, a distinction yes. just a minute ago about West Circassia as opposed to maybe East mm-hmm. Circassia or the North or South. But there's 12 communities within the Circassia, which, which within one ethnic group is showing lots of diversity within one group, which is, which is absolutely wild. Um, even within one ethnic group in one region, how did it also have all of these kind of sub kinds of communities. And I guess the, the larger question here is, is I, and we will probably get to this later, but you know, how does them residing in Turkey today impact right. the kind of, um, uh, I guess the kind of um, sensitivity of, of some of these groups kind of surviving and these communities kind of surviving. Right. So the Circassians and, uh, they call themselves Adige, right? In their native language, they're indigenous people mm-hmm. from the Northwest Caucasus. And yes, in the 19th century, there were at least 12 distinct communities of Circassians, and they all have different dialects of Circassian, different traditions. Mm-hmm. 10 of them are known as Western Circassians, mm-hmm. and two of them are Eastern Circassians. And that's really about the geography sure. of where they were mm-hmm. in the Caucasus. And uh, by the end of the Caucasus War, 1864, up to 90% of Western Circassians were expelled to the Ottoman Empire. So most Western Circassians now live in the Middle East, Mm. not in the the Caucasus. So the phenomenal thing here is that the Circassian national identity was forming in diaspora in the Ottoman Empire. It was only as refugees that many Circassians got to meet people from other Circassian communities, Mm. right? And it was only two generations after expulsions that Circassian intellectuals, usually educated in Ottoman Turkish, usually based in Istanbul, they started putting together the first Circassian dictionary, Mm. publishing the first Circassian newspaper, organizing the first Circassian language school curriculum. Mm. We can also think about how different, because of the displacement, Circassians are in the Middle East and in the Caucasus. Mm. So in diaspora, certain communities are well represented because of who was expelled. So, for example, Shapsuks, Abzaks, Kabardians, and Circassians of smaller groups in diaspora, uh, they would often adopt a dialect of a larger group. But meanwhile, the communities who remained in the Caucasus, um, they're not necessarily the same. The Bzeduks, Temirgois, Beslinis, Kabardians. Mm. So because of that, in the 20th century, the literary norms of the Circassian language, they diverged Mm. in the Middle East and in the Caucasus because of which dialects were uh, prioritized, you know, which communities actually were in those regions. Mm. And as I mentioned previously about the whole, the autonomies in the Caucasus, it gets even more complicated. So in the 20th century, in the Soviet era, the Soviet authorities approved the development of four nationalities or four ethnic identities for Circassians, even though historically they were one people. Mm. So four ethnic groups in the Caucasus are Shapsuks, Kabardians, Adige, and Cherkes. And they had their own four administrative units with different levels of autonomy. Mm. And of those four, three survive today as autonomous republics um, in the North Caucasus. That is that is that is absolutely incredible. It's it's one of those things that for <laughs> for us Westerners, uh, we we don't we don't hear a lot about this uh, distinct kinds of ethnicities in one you know small region of sorts, at least you know kind of by kilometers or whatever. So it's it's just it's it's absolutely incredible, and and to think um, you know where where Circassians and other uh, folks that are from the North Caucasus regions, how there there is this large diaspora more recently. Uh, right. it's, it's, it's interesting how you were saying in the beginning there about building kind of community or how they continue to meet each other through diaspora is, is, is absolutely, uh, interesting, um, for, you know, it's hard to think of another, there might be other 
uh, people groups like that. But it's hard to think about it right at top of mind, more modern of, of, of something like that happening. So it's very, very interesting. So, okay. So in, 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 uh, during the, the fifties and sixties, uh, the place to go, it appears was the Ottoman empire. So if, if Russia is, uh, absolutely terrible for these people groups, uh, and there's a lot of, uh, ethnic cleansing that's going on, uh, you're going to get the hell out of there so you can, you survive and your peoples can survive. So the Ottoman empire you're talking about this in the book is at least initially there's kind of, uh, some, 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 uh, uh, complications here, obviously, as we'll, we'll probably get into, but the Ottoman empire saw themselves as kind of welcoming to refugees for the Caucasus region. Uh, and again, the book is called empire of, of refugees. Right. And so there's, mm-hmm. there's this interesting thing about how the Ottoman empire was placing themselves here. Now, I guess the question would be why, why would they take in, all of these different people groups and ethnic groups and, and uh, you know, there is, um, you know, I don't like to do this kind of presentism kind of thing, but, you know, we, we, we continue to have uh, arguments today, uh, right now about uh, refugees and where they go and who takes who in and the most of it is, is the, the role of, uh, of um, Islam uh, critical here or is that just kind of uh, by happenstance? Uh, was it geopolitical? I guess why was the Ottoman Empire willing to to welcome uh, many of these refugees. Right. So let's start with the geopolitics of it all. In the 19th century, the, the Ottoman Empire was not doing well. The empire was losing territories since the late 18th century. Uh, in the 1820s, it lost Greece. Then France occupied Algeria in 1830. Mm-hmm. Then the Ottomans lost control over Egypt, Serbia, the Danubian principalities. And then in 1878, uh, the Ottomans lost like half of their remaining territories in the Balkans. Mm-hmm. So that's the crucial context. Mm-hmm. As the Ottoman territory is shrinking, um, Ottoman sovereignty is constantly being undermined by the European governments. Mm-hmm. And the empire is also losing its population. And the arrival of Muslim refugees who want to be in the Ottoman Empire, it's a welcome development for the Ottoman government, a welcome development both demographically and economically. Mm. The government wants to increase its population, specifically to increase the tax base and the agricultural labor force that would feed the empire and that would potentially uh, export cash crops. Mm. So that's one reason, a very pragmatic Mm -hmm. one, for the Ottoman Empire being so welcoming Mm. to the refugees. Mm. But the religious component is also very important. The Ottoman sultans were caliphs. Mm -hmm. Uh, or political successors to the Prophet Muhammad. And it was their duty to protect Muslims wherever those Muslims were. And that self-vision becomes very important um, as the empire is shrinking and is being humiliated by the Europeans. So the idea of the Ottoman Caliphate is resurgent um, in the late 19th century. And as caliphs, Ottoman sultans couldn't refuse to accept Muslim refugees without damage to the legitimacy, Mm. to the self-vision of the caliphate, right? The caliphate's reputation came to rest on the acceptance and resettlement of those Muslims who fled the displacement and and the dispossession by European empires. So this generosity towards Muslim refugees, it was doing many things for the Ottomans, including helping their internal and external image as benevolent protectors of Islam. Mm. It's very, it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing because it, it, again, it kind of speaks a little bit to the, the Ottomans uh, as being on the one hand, uh, very powerful, even though they were starting to lose a grip on things, but also being very pragmatic in how they're trying to figure things out administratively. Let's, let's think about uh, a little bit more specific here. The mm-hmm. three regions that many of the, the refugees uh, go to are the Balkans, Anatolia, and the Levant. Um, and currently, uh, we see these countries as Turkey, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Israel, Iraq, Georgia, Bulgaria, Romania, Serbia, Kosovo, Greece, Cyprus, and North Macedonia. So I guess the question is, I, I, I'm for listeners, I, I have notes. I didn't remember all those off the top of my head, right? <laughs> <laughs> that would be impressive. I, <laughs> there's no, there's no tricks here, right? I have notes, right? <laughs> um, I guess the que- there's two questions here is, so obviously the Ottoman Empire sp- 
expand a lot of this region, although the Balkan mm-hmm. periods was being sort of, you know, a little bit, I guess, lost or seeded of sorts. But why these three regions, I guess, kind of here, Balkans, Anatolia, and Levant? Mm-hmm. And then second to that is a kind of uh, perspective question of how do all of these refugees impact the kind of uh, ethnic makeup of these countries today? How, how do we see the kind of ripple effect of of this uh, uh, waves of migration in this period? Right. So the Balkans, Anatolia, and the Levant, these are three kind of main historical regions of the Ottoman Empire. Mm-hmm. And in the 19th century, with those mass displacements and mass immigration, the Ottoman government opens up pretty much much of the empire for refugee resettlement. There were few, very few exceptions. The prominent exceptions were Palestine, uh, although there were a few villages, Lebanon, Yemen, and North Africa. Yemen and North Africa because they were simply too far and it, was too, it would be too expensive mm. to resettle refugees there all the way from the Caucasus. Um, so today, not so the, uh, the refugees were resettled on the, in the territories of today's 14 independent nation states. Right. Then they were all part of the Ottoman Empire. But not all of those communities survive today. Uh, some were expelled. Mm. So in the 1860s, about half of all incoming Circassian refugees were settled in the Balkans mm. and the other half of, in Anatolia. But they only spent about one generation in the Balkans. Mm. And then there was another Russo-Ottoman War of 1877-78 and virtually all Circassians who were settled in modern-day Bulgaria, Romania, and Serbia were expelled. They became double refugees, and then they fled to either Ottoman Anatolia or Ottoman Syria. Mm. But so today, uh, in the diaspora, the largest remaining North Caucasian communities are in Turkey, Jordan and Syria, mm. and they've had massive impact uh, on demographics in the Middle East. So in Turkey, as you mentioned, is between two and three million people no. who are in diaspora. Of course, most people in the diaspora in Turkey would no longer speak their ancestors' languages from the Caucasus. Assimilation has been massive in the 20th century in Turkey. But nevertheless, North Caucasians, they're an established part of the cultural landscape in Turkey, and many families, they don't speak their ancestors' languages, but they know that they're Circassians or Setians, and there's a massive pride in that identity. Mm, mm. Now, in Jordan, Jordan is a very special case because the capital city of Jordan, Amman, it's also the largest city in the Levant right now, it was established as a Circassian refugee mm-hmm, village mm-hmm. in 1878. So in Jordan, Circassians and Chechens today are less than 1% of the population. but three of the four largest cities in Jordan started as refugee villages. Mm. Um, So the cultural and the economic impact of this small refugee community has been massive um, on the modern nation state of Jordan. Mm. And in Syria, Syria is a similar story to Jordan in many ways. Again, it's a very well integrated community. Uh, Some people preserve their languages. Uh, Many families lost the languages. And North Caucasians in Syria, like all Syrian citizens, were subjected to to true horrors Mm -hmm. in the last 12 years. Mm -hmm. So we don't really know how many people remain in the country, how many North Caucasians remain in Syria today, because many have fled and became refugees. Um, And North Caucasian refugees from Syria, um, they often relied on networks and on charity from other North Caucasians. Mm in Turkey and in Jordan. So those networks, right, that solidarity within the North Caucasian diaspora is very much alive today. uh, And it was on display. It has been on display during the Syrian civil war. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the, 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 the ongoing conflict in Syria is, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, just grotesque and horrific for many. I mean, everyone there that's involved, but I mean, for some uh, people groups, it means more displacement or more uh, kinds of atrocities, which is, which is, uh, you know, just awful. Um, so, so I guess let's, let's talk about Russia for a minute. So we've kind of talked about a little bit about mm-hmm. Ottoman empire. Let's talk about Russia. So a lot of people don't know that 
Uh, Muslims were the second largest religious community in Russia after Orthodox Christians. Um, mm -hmm. And there's this ethnic cleansing in the region in the 1860s, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. 62 to 64. Um, why? Was this just a, uh, you know, trying to, 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 to rid out uh, Muslims from, from, from Russia? Or, you know, uh, is it particular that they were mostly Sunni Muslims or... Or was there other reasons? Was it other ty types of, uh, you know, kind of hate? You know, there's different reasons. I mean, ethnic cleansing is awful wherever it happens, but there are certain reasons that can be, uh, you know, um, uh, particularly relevant of like why this group or why at this time or things like that. So for Russia at this period, what's their like reasoning or rationale uh, for, for, for doing this? So, yeah, thank you for this question. Muslims have been the second largest religious religious community in Russia for a very long time, mm -hmm. at least since the conquest of Kazan and Astrakhan by <laughs> Ivan the Terrible in the mid 16th century. Yeah. So all the way from then until today, right? And this is important because the Russian state had long had Muslim populations, and there were all kinds of different mechanisms of governing Muslims and Islam. And there's there's amazing literature. Um, historical literature in the field. So was the ethnic cleansing of Circassians an attempt to reduce Muslim population in Russia as a whole? No. M many Muslim populations in different parts of Russia, they did not experience ethnic cleansing in the 19th century. It's a very specific story, specific to the Caucasus and also specific to Crimea in decades prior. So, so why did it happen in the North Caucasus? The Russian military during the Caucasus War, which was a very long war uh, for pretty much the first half of the 19th century, they wanted to occupy the Northwest Caucasus for strategic purposes because controlling the Circassian coast, by controlling the Circassian coast and the Black Sea, they could solidify control over the entire Western Caucasus and they could secure as a safe road to Georgia. Georgia already was within the Russian Empire. So how did they go about it? The Russian military chose to violently remove a population that had resisted Russian advances the most in the region and could potentially challenge Russia's control over this new borderland, over this new frontier region. So And, and the, the expulsions were horrendous. The Russian military was setting um, villages on fire and was essentially provoking the mass flight, the flight of terror. Like people were fleeing to the coast for their survival. And then they were boarding uh, boats and just, just fleeing to the Ottoman Empire. And um, it's another part of the story. Many, many people, somewhere up to a quarter um, of Circassians fleeing in 1863, 64, uh, they drowned. Because those, those boats, they simply... You can't cross part of the Black Sea, right, in the middle of the night on, the, on those, yeah. you know, boats. That, so it was horrendous. But I want to say that at the same time, yes, there's military strategy, but the Circassian's identity was not irrelevant to their being targeted for expulsions. Russia expelled this community, not because they were Circassians or Muslims per se, but because Russian generals believed that their Muslim identity and their connections to the Ottoman Empire made them an unreliable frontier population. Mm. So here we see a very dangerous conflation of Russia's notions of ethnicity, religion, and loyalty to the empire, which resulted in this violent displacement and the cleansing of the Circassian coast. And it's the same logic later on, right, that ethno-religious identity equals loyalty or disloyalty that results in, um, in the genocide of Armenians, Assyrians, and Greeks in the Ottoman Empire in the 1910s, uh, war crimes against Muslims in the Balkans in the 1910s, uh, and the Greek-Turkish population exchange mm. in 1923. Mm. So just to recap, it did matter to the Russian military that this population on the border was Muslim because of the imperial officials and imperial officers' biases about who Muslims were and what Islam was. That's very interesting. That's a very nuanced answer, which I, I appreciate. I guess I, I don't want to 
again, I don't like to do the presentism kind of thing because obviously it's different times and context and stuff. But a lot of this does sound somewhat familiar or similar to many of the things that have been going on as well with certain ethnic groups in you know Ukraine and Russia as well, where you have these regions where 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 there's this idea of yes, they're on these territories. Yes, this is the frontier to you know NATO or the West or whatever. So you don't have to speak on it if you don't want to, but. Is it, is it a kind of similar idea of, my question is, is ethnic groups or certain uh, um, autonomous zones or things like that are, when they're on frontier lands, they're always kind of in the mix. They're always kind of caught in the middle of sorts. Uh, or is it just completely different? So they're caught in the middle not because of anything that they do. Right, right. right it's right. about the empire. It's yeah. about the empire that is expanding and is completely disregarding mm-hmm. all those populations, right? So the Russian empire, like, that's, that's the constant in the story then mm-hmm. and the story now, mm-hmm. right? And what Russia is doing uh, in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. But I do say that, I will say that Russian nationalism Right? It's often imagined as a, as a modern story, the story in the, of the 20th century, but we can see Russian nationalism pretty clear in the 19th century in the Caucasus. The Russia, like already in the 1860s, 1870s, Russian officials are clear about whom they see as the, the ideal population mm. in the Caucasus, in this multi-ethnic Caucasus with dozens of ethnic mm-hmm. groups. It's, it's a Russian peasant. Mm. They're pretty clear that it has to be a Russian-speaking person, uh, a Russian Orthodox, because that's the only population on whom they could really rely in the strategic borderland mm. close to the Ottoman Empire in Iran. So the biases against everyone who is not mm. like us, mm. they were very much there. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, it's a, I think because the history is not that far away, it's interesting to see again, I think what you're saying, these kind of origins or these kind of seeds there of this kind of nationalism, this unhealthy nationalism that's taking place. And we see the kind of reverberations of that, you know, even until today. There's a there's an interesting point you make about uh, Ottoman and, and Russian migration policies, mm-hmm. that they were different, but still for consolidating imperial authority. Can you can you describe what you mean by that? How, that, that there, there's differences, but how are they still for consolidating, you know, kind of empire, you know, things like that. Right. So, yeah, the Ottoman and Russian policies towards Muslim migration, towards Muslim refugees, they couldn't be more different. So the Ottoman Empire is, let's say, maximally inclusive, right? All Muslim refugees are welcome to enter at any time Mm -hmm. in the late Ottoman Mm -hmm. era. Meanwhile, for the Russian Empire in the Caucasus and also in Crimea, very harsh policies, right? There's an ethnic cleansing on the Circassian coast, then the Russian government was encouraging or abetting Muslim emigration. And then the Russian government was also preventing return migration. So Muslim refugees who left or who were expelled, they couldn't come back to the Russian empire. The roadway were cl- was closed. Mm. So very, very different policies, right? Mm. But then the goals were similar. The goal was the same. It's, it was to strengthen imperial rule. Mm. The Ottoman policy was inclusive towards foreign Muslims because the Ottoman state got to benefit from it. Mm. The government could use refugees to increase the population, to bring unused land into cultivation, Mm. to harass and rein in the nomads Mm. on the nomadic frontier in in the Levant, to strengthen the empire's hold on Christian majority regions. Mm. For example, in Western Anatolia, where there were many Greeks, or in Eastern Anatolia, where there were many Armenians, Mm. right? So that's what the Ottomans were doing with the refugees. Whereas for the Russians, the Russian government excluded all those North Caucasian Muslims uh, because it perceived them as Russia's opponents during and after the Caucasus War. Like both empires developed a sectarian logic, Mm. equating one's religious identity with their loyalty to a co-religionist state, right? So Muslims in Russia to the Ottoman Empire, Christians in the Ottoman Empire to Russia. So the Russians had a very hard time conquering the North Caucasus and then suppressing anti-colonial rebellions Mm. in the North Caucasus. And so their assumption was that Muslims, 
especially those Muslims who had already left, they can never be loyal to the Tsar, mm. right, to the Russian emperor. Right. They can only ever be loyal to the Sultan. Mm. So again, very different policies, but the same idea to strengthen imperial rules so that no one could challenge it. Mm. Yeah. There's a, there's a term that you introduce somewhere kind of quarter of the way, I think, through the book, and then you, you kind of talk about, you know, th- use it throughout is th- this term used to describe North Caucasian refugees as muhajir. Uh, could you explain the significance and utility of the term? I only bring it up because uh, you do explain it and, and it, it does kind of appear throughout the, the rest of the book. Uh, yeah, what's the significance of this term? Right, thank you. So now we're going to introduce early Islamic history to this. Very great. So this is a key term in my book, Muhajir. And this is the term that North Caucasian refugees themselves used to describe themselves, right? So um, the Arabic term, Muhajir, is derived from Hijra. Hijra was the journey of the Prophet Muhammad from Mecca to Medina in the 7th century. And uh, it was a journey to preserve the, uh, the Muslim faith. The companions of the Prophet Muhammad, they used the term muhajir to describe themselves. And then throughout Islamic history, Muslim communities who had left or who, who, who were expelled, who had to save their faith and move to a Muslim country, they would call themselves muhajir in emulation of the Prophet and his companions. So by the 19th century, this term is widely used in many regions across the Muslim world because they're being occupied by the European empires, and so many Muslims are fleeing, usually to the Ottoman Empire. Mm. So this term has very powerful genealogy Mm. in Islamic history. It allowed Muslim refugees to place their experiences within the narrative of Islamic history. It helped them to make sense of their displacement Mm. and also to gain refuge in Muslim countries and to gain support um, and sympathy from other Muslims, because everyone knew of this term. Everyone knew the religious significance of this term. Mm. I also want to be clear that in the 19th and 20th centuries, hijra, right, this journey, it's never voluntary, right? It's usually a result of ethnic cleansing or genocide or famine or something horrendous. No one really becomes muhajir, mm. right, of their own mm. accord, right? There's always a push. But there's also this strong religious element. You're fleeing to preserve your faith and to remain Muslim. And you, need, you can only do that by fleeing to a Muslim country. So that's important. Did other people um, receive it that way? So if they were calling themselves this and they were recognizing it in the kind of spirit of that, did other, let's say more, let's say stationary Muslims in other places, maybe, maybe in Anatolia or the Levant, did they kind of accept it and realize it as such? Like, we, we get what you're saying, we know it, or was it kind of met with resistance? What was the kind of reception of that? Absolutely, yeah. So many uh, people in the Ottoman Empire, I wouldn't just say it wasn't only Muslims, it's many Ottoman subjects, mm. right? They were donating charity uh, to these refugees. So, so there was much sympathy. Also, it was the only term to describe migration. It was the term with which the Ottoman Empire operating. Mm. So, yes. Mm. Also, the term muhajir, it's not, the story doesn't just end in the early 20th century. It's still a very common term in many languages in the Muslim world. Mm. So many Muslims would be familiar with the genealogy of the term muhajir. Mm. In the Ottoman Empire, and then in its successor states, like the Republic of Turkey, like Syria, muhajir became a social identity of kinds. Mm. So in the 20th century, Um, Many people in the second and third and fourth generations, right, growing up Circassian Mm -hmm. or Bosnian or Albanian or Bulgarian, right, their ancestors were expelled. They would still call themselves Muhajir, even though, you know, they would Mm -hmm. speak Arabic or Turkish as their first language at that point. Mm -hmm. They grew up in Muhajir neighborhoods. They heard stories about their grandparents' emigration and displacement. It became a social identity in its own right. And again, a matter of of pride, right? That our origins are elsewhere and we have immigrated here to save ourselves uh, and to escape religious persecution. Mm. Yeah, that's very, very important. I mean, that, again, this is, uh, I think, really, really important to kind of understand of the, the different kinds of uh, lenses that this kind of term or, or identifier can be used to be seen socially or religiously or, you know, all of these other things. I think that that's a, 
important and, and critical fact. So just tell us, I guess, uh, briefly, I mean, we, we've, we've kind of talked a little bit about it, but um, <clears throat> you, you document in the book, there were basically four major waves or periods of North Caucasian mm. migrations into the Ottoman Empire, uh, 1850s to 1862. So there's a kind of a big kind of, you know, tennis year gap there. There's obviously 1863 to 1864, which mm-hmm. is when this Russia um, cleansing was happening. 65 to 78, that's a big big gap there. It's, it's, uh, it's almost 15 years. And then what happens post-1878? So just kind of, just loosely kind of just give us the overview of, of why it's broken down into these periods and anything distinct in each, of, each one of them. Right. So any division into any chronological periods, that's the work of a historian, right? right, right? right, right, we, right. Do, we do it to make things make sense. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so I guess the first major um, arrival of, of, of North Caucasians, that's before 1862. So the Caucasus War is still raging, mm. right? And at this point, the Russians are building settlements, military settlements uh, on the coast of Circassia to cut off access for Circassians in the foothills of the Northwest Caucasus from the coast. Mm. And then the Russians are taking over Circassian villages one by one. In this period, about 150,000 mm. Circassians and Nogai Tatars um, leave. Mm. They flee to the Ottoman Empire. Mm. Then the next big period, the largest one, it's just the two years, 1863, 1864. This is the end of the Caucasus War. This is when the military perpetrates um, ethnic cleansing. This is when the Circassian villages are burning and people flee to the coast. Mm. Today, many Circassians in diaspora um, call for the recognition of the events of 1863 and 64 as genocide. Mm-hmm. And in the 1990s, when there was a very brief period of some openness and free speech mm-hmm. uh, in Russia, the, the two Circassian republics, kabardino balkaria and Adygea, they also recognized those events as, mm-hmm. as genocide. Mm-hmm. So then after 1864, the Caucasus is fully within the Russian Empire, but emigration doesn't stop. Emigration continues, and it continues across the board from practically every ethnic group in the region. Mm. It cuts across social classes as well. So rich people, the aristocrats, Muslim aristocrats would flee, and also you know, the, the peasant population. And uh, so it's across the board. Mm. And the main reason for that flight is is the land reforms. So Russia is doing all kinds of land reforms, redrawing borders in the region, and many people are losing land um, and they flee. Also, there's colonization. Colonization by Slavic settlers, usually Russians and Ukrainians, and the shrinkage of um, indigenous geography Mm. in the region. And, all, and the new laws that Russia passes, they tend to privilege the settlers mm. over the indigenous Muslim population. Mm. So that's, that's why many people live in that period. And then there's, there's the war, the war of 1877-78, uh, a major war between the Ottoman Empire and the Russia, the Ottomans lose. Uh, the war is on the two fronts, in the Balkans and in the Caucasus. Mm. And there's several uprisings in the Caucasus in support of the Ottoman Empire. So it's an anti-colonial uprisings against Russian rule. Russia suppresses those rebellions in Dagestan, in Chechnya, in Abkhazia, and then people have to emigrate. They they don't have a choice. They again they flee to save themselves. Mm. Uh, and then I mean immigration continues, but at a much slower pace, all the way into World War One, and then even into into the 1920s. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's just interesting because obviously the the big one it sounds like is in you know sixty three sixty four, but there's really been this like more or less constant uh, migration from you know for seventy years, seventy eighty years, which is which is kind of wild when you think about it. Like that's a long time to always kind of having to be displaced, having to move, having to be this you know all these things is is a uh, is a long time. As you're talking generations was that three generations i mean that's that's a long time to be to kind of be be moving around it's really one like a constant yeah. in, in in russian ottoman relations and in russian imperial and ottoman history mm. that muslims kept moving from russia to the ottoman empire 
And also that Christians from the Ottoman Empire, they started moving to Russia as well. It was never in the same numbers, mm -hmm. right, as, as the Muslim displacements from Russia, but still uh, pretty large numbers, tens of thousands of Bulgarians from Ottoman Bulgaria were moving to Russia starting in the mm. uh, first half of the 19th century. And then many Ottoman Greeks and Ottoman Armenians, they're moving to the Russian Caucasus, mm. Mm -hmm. rather Caucasus under Russian rule. Yeah. So it's, it's an exchange of populations of sorts, except it wasn't sanctioned mm. by either government. Mm. It's people are fleeing because they think that they will find safety on the other side. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so kind of similar to that is you talk about these two kinds of migration. So one being forced resettlement of Muslim communities, and then second, mass colonialization of the Caucasus by Christians. Can you talk about those two different uh, forms of migration there? So this is the migration within uh, the borders of the Russian Empire, within the Caucasus. So on the one hand, the Russian government is forcibly relocating Muslim com communities after the conquest especially Circassians and Chechens, and they're being relocated from the highlands to the lowlands, mm. right? The government mandates that these people should leave their homes and they should move to a new environment where they would be surrounded by Cossack military stations, mm. right? Or Slavic settler homesteads. So it's very much a military measure to control the indigenous population and to prevent any kind of uprising. Mm. So to give you an example, in 1865 to 67, 93 villages in Kabarda region were forcibly reorganized in 33, right? So it just, it's just the massive overhaul of indigenous societies. Mm -hmm. And the government knew fully well that many people, they will not move to the lowlands, but instead they will emigrate to the Ottoman Empire to escape mm -hmm. this. So on the other hand, we have mass immigration of Christian settlers in the Caucasus. Um, and it's an explicit, explicit case of settler colonialism. When a settler population favored by the empire is replacing a population that is not favored by the empire. Most settlers were Cossacks who served in the Cossack hosts, helping Russia to expand its border. And also many Russian and Ukrainian peasants who didn't have enough land in the central Russian or in provinces or in Ukraine, and the government was giving them free land in the Caucasus. Mm. But there were also others. There were Poles, Estonians, Latvians, Bulgarians, Ottoman Greeks, right, and other immigrants all arriving in the Caucasus. So as in many parts of the world in the imperial age, displacement and dispossession of indigenous communities, um, you know, go in hand with the immigration and land acquisition by settler communities. But here, in this case, religion is front and center. The first group are almost exclusively Muslims. Mm. And the second group, the ones who are arriving and settling, they're almost exclusively Christians. Mm. Yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting how there, within, within the space, there's this kind of colliding that's happening, right? You have this movement that's mo different people coming and going. Uh, and there's these different, you know, some groups are getting totally swept out. Other groups are coming in. It's just very interesting how we, we place certain things or place certain emphasis on certain groups as opposed to others for various reasons. Um, and, uh, you know, I think obviously the, the humanity definitely, uh, gets lost. So you talk about, um, this, we can talk a little bit about more specific here. So you spend some time in the book on this. So how did the Ottoman Empire be, be this empire of refugees? What was, how was this set up? So there was a, there's a particular way in which there was a refugee regime after 1860. Um, you mentioned the uh, 1857 immigration law, the 1858 land code for how this was built. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, they're moving them in certain places in the Balkans, in the in Anatolia, in, in the Levant. How are these two laws super instrumental? This wasn't just, all right, here's some people groups, here's some folks that are here, we're just going to put them there. Like These things were codified in some of their legal kinds of aspects of doing things. Uh, maybe talk about some of the kind of uh, specifics here of, of or behind the scenes here of how the Ottoman Empire was, was going about doing this, of, of bringing people in. Obviously, they had their own motivations mm -hmm. for it. 
but how they did it specifically in, in, in uh, including the legal components. Right. So maybe let's start with the definition, right, of a refugee yeah, regime. Yeah, please. Like a refugee regime is usually understood as a set of principles, norms, and procedures uh, governing the acceptance and resettlement of refugees. Mm. But when we talk about uh, refugee regimes, we usually talk about an international refugee regime mm -hmm. set up by the United Nations mm -hmm. after World War II. Right. And the 1951 Refugee Convention is this cornerstone document mm -hmm. of the contemporary refugee regime. Mm -hmm. Now, historians, they showed that actually in the interwar era, the League of Nations inaugurated refugee protections that could be considered the first international refugee regime. Mm. And so my contribution in this book is, well, we can go even earlier, much earlier. In the second half of the 19th century, a Muslim country, the Ottoman Empire, was offering what was re something that was remarkably similar to refugee protections that one expects today, right? So it was the Ottoman refugee regime. And at the core of it was, again, to use modern terminology, was the Ottoman responsibility to protect, right? The Ottoman Sultan here was a caliph. And as a caliph, there was a responsibility to protect Muslims, right? There were a set of expectations within the regime. Expectations on behalf of Muslim refugees and also ordinary Ottoman citizens and Ottoman bureaucrats that, yes, the Ottoman Empire, of course, has a responsibility to protect. Refugees are our co-religionists. They're persecuted by non-Muslims, persecuted because of Islam. So, of course, the government has to admit them. And those expectations they radiated beyond the Ottoman borders. So people in the Caucasus, in Crimea, in parts of the Balkans, they knew about it, that they would be welcome and accepted in the Ottoman Empire. So it was internationalized, this refugee regime, to a certain extent. So now the, uh, the legislative portion of it. There are two main laws that provided the legal backbone for the regime. The first one was the 1857 immigration law. This law became a cornerstone of Ottoman immigration. Uh, the government guaranteed all immigrants coming into the Ottoman Empire free land, free agricultural land, and an exemption from taxes and from military service for six years in the Balkans and for 12 years in Anatolia. Also, there was a clear pathway to Ottoman citizenship. So, that's 1857 immigration law, that, which was groundbreaking I mean, in Ottoman history. That's quite a deal. I mean, that's a deal <laughs> by today's standards. That's wild. It sounds like, so it's very similar to, um, to immigration laws in other empires and, and nation states of the time. So if uh -huh. we th think about Canada, if we think about the United States, the Homestead Acts, they sure, actually, yeah, sure. they're even competing in some ways. The idea was that the Ottomans would be competing for the same kinds of immigrants who go to the United States or Argentina. It didn't really happen ever. Mm. But yes, so in theory, good deal. In practice, it rarely happened that way. Mm. Mm -hmm. Refugees were often complaining about the kind of land that they received. Like, yes, they were supposed to receive, let's say, I don't know, 20 acres of land, but the government would give them 20 acres in the marshes yeah. where you could not produce anything and where you would die because of malaria, mm. right? So in practice, didn't always work like mm. this. That's the immigration law. Then there's the land code of 1858. And that's the cornerstone of our Ottoman land tenure. I think it's <laughs> the most important law that was passed in the 19th century because it was actually inherited by Ottoman successor states, the Turkish Republic and, uh, um, and Israel and Lebanon and Syria and Palestine, right? So in some ways, those laws, mm. in their refashioned way, they, su they survived until today. Mm. So the land code standardized many practices of the empire. Uh, regarding land tenure. The goal of that legislation was to increase tax payments to the imperial treasury and to open up new areas for economic development. The land code was very favorable to, for immigration because it reaffirmed that it was the state that owned agriculture, much of the agricultural land in the empire. Right? It wasn't the people. Like The ownership stayed with the land. People they had the usufruct rights, which the state could 
take away. So it was, it was the state's land to give to whomever it wanted. And the land code mandated that if agricultural land is unused for three years, then the state can take it from those people who held temporary usufruct rights and reassign it to someone else. Mm -hmm. So as you can imagine, this was very important for immigration, for the arrival of refugees, because it meant that the government potentially had some land freed up for the settlement of those people. And more land could be made available if the government does the whole survey of the land, figures out who is not using the agricultural land, they could just take that land away and give it to refugees. So those two laws, the immigration law and the land code, that's really the cornerstone of this all. But to have an effective refugee regime, you need the executor, right? Someone who would be doing all, you know, mm-hmm. who would be settling mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. And that's the Refugee Commission. Mm-hmm. The Ottoman Refugee Commission, founded in 1860. Mm. And this commission, we can think of it as one of the largest resettlement agencies in the world all the way until World War I. Because between 1860 and World War I, it settled up to 3 million refugees. Wow. If we include World War I, we can talk about up to 5 million people. Wow. Wow. That, that, that's, that's, that's quite a feat. Uh, okay, so I have a few questions about the land uh, law piece of it. That is pretty, pretty spectacular in a, in, a, in a lot of ways. So it's basically like people were, were renting out land of sorts. Like the government owned it, but we're going to give it to you. And if it's not used in three years, then we'll give it to someone else. Like it's a kind of, mm-hmm. uh, maybe, maybe this is a, maybe not a good example, but it's like a, it's, like a, it's almost like we'll let you rent this out of sorts, right? Like you don't own it, but you can use it. Or is that, is that a wrong analogy to make? You, you don't own it, but the, the right to that land, it can be, it's almost permanent. You can pass it on to your children and they can pass it on to, to their children just as long as you keep tilling the land mm. and as long as you keep mm. paying the taxes mm. to the state. Mm. So the problem is that not everyone was understanding those kind of, uh, the legality that was actually the state that owns the land. Mm-hmm. So in some parts of the empire, notably in Palestine, the land sales starts to occur to third parties mm. without the understanding oh. that technically it's the state that owns the land. So the Ottoman government passed that land code in part to make their legislation legible mm. to Europeans, mm. right? To attract investment mm-hmm. in the Ottoman Empire. However, the system was different from what you know, many Europeans were used to. Mm. And they interpreted this land code as private property mm. in the Ottoman mm. Empire, but it never mm. was private property from the Ottoman Interesting. Empire. Interesting. So I guess the question, and maybe this is a, a little bit out of your purview a little bit, but I'm curious. How did the Ottomans, so was, okay, two, two, two parts here. One, was this for only in the regions in which the, 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 the migrants came and were settled? So part of the Balkans, part of the Anatolia, part of mm-hmm. Levant, or did, was this a, a land law for all of the Ottoman empire? Like this is for the entire empire. That's for the entire empire, but also refugees settled pretty much almost okay. everywhere. So second part of this is where did that come from? Right. So it's not, you know, historically people know that, you know, many, many people groups in Anatolia and Eastern Turkey and things like that uh, have origins, you know, from the steppe and things like that. And they're very nomadic. Was there, were there certain ideas about, about at least in late Ottoman period that were kind of from this long history of having nomadic culture and having many years of all this administrative rule of how they saw land was there something kind of almost endogenous for how they did things that they wanted to do it this way? Uh, I don't know if that's, you know. Uh, no, no, we're wading into some interesting territory <laughs> here. because It's an entire subfield. Ottoman tenure is yeah, fascinating. Yeah, it is very fascinating, and again, it's, yes. It's six centuries of rule <laughs> on this massive territory. Yes. So, like, there's a very long history to this. Yeah. I'll just say that basically in the 19th century, the Ottomans... They want more taxes. I mean, a state, when it's modernizing, when it's centralized, it wants more ta- taxes. Yeah. And 
the Ottomans figure out by the 19th century that it's better to move land tenure and land ownership on the individual basis. That was really the big change in the 19th century. Mm. Before that, there was a tax assessment and it was, let's say, an entire village or an entire nomadic community that was paying a certain amount of tax to the Ottoman, uh, to the Ottoman government. With the Ottoman land code, it's all individual, mm. right? Like you as individual have this relationship with the state. Mm. The land belongs to the state, but you can mm. have use of rights and you have to pay your individual taxes. So that's the big change. Mm. And also this law, it's part of the, the Tanzimat, which is reorganization, restructuring in the Ottoman Empire when a lot of new legislation is being passed. And all this legislation, it's... The idea is to, I guess, to, to standardize. Mm. The idea is also to modernize. Mm -hmm. And how do you modernize? Well, the Ottomans are at this period. In this period, they're looking at France, they're looking at Austria, mm. and they're taking a lot of elements from, from the European experience. Mm. So I guess this, the whole focus on the individual, yeah. that's it's from there. This is really interesting because, uh, you know, you, you, especially at the very end of the Ottoman Empire and, and I guess the first president of Turkey or whatever, um, I mean, modernization was huge. I mean, even even now, I mean, you can see um, Turkey today has, has some effects from from right at the end and the first you know president. Uh, that's a, that's, when you when you have such a long history, six hundred plus years, how many times like things things move slower, you know, in the fifteenth century, in the sixteenth century, in the seventeenth century, but as if things were changing quickly, it, it sounded like they were not unfamiliar to changes or how they had to kind of redo things uh, going from maybe an agrarian to even maybe slightly industrial or whatever it is, but how, how, how they were trying to figure out an evolving world or a changing world and different things that were happening. Um, again, it's, it's, it's quite a fascinating story. It really is a fascinating story of how they were trying to figure out administratively how to govern huge, huge, huge sections of land. A successful empire needs to be good at evolving. <laughs> yeah, for, for sure. <laughs> so, okay. Um, let's talk about, I guess, the, the Balkans. This is an interesting case here. So this kind of gets to the middle part of the book. Mm -hmm. Why did a lot of North uh, Caucasians go to the Balkans in the 60s, but then they get pushed out in the 70s? Was this because this was part of the region mm -hmm. of the Ottoman Empire that was also kind of coming out of them, becoming more independent states at this period? Or... What was the idea of this? They were there for a little bit, and then they, they, they right. not only, they come from the North Caucasus regions, they go to the Balkans to then only get pushed out again, you know, less within less than 10 years. What, what's the story there about what didn't work there for, for, for these folks? Right. So, so during this major refugee crisis in 1863-64, uh, up to half a million Circassians arrive in the Ottoman Empire. There's a refugee crisis in the Ottoman ports, the Ottomans have to figure out where to send people. And about half of them, they're in Anatolia, and half of them go to the Balkans. It's right across from the Caucasus, across the Black Sea. Uh, but yes, they only stay there for a generation because the, another Russo-Ottoman war breaks out in 1877. And during the war, and a year prior to the war, during the April uprising, the Bulgarian nationalist uprising, there's an explosion of sectarian violence or violence along religious lines, mm. Christians versus Muslims. There are many militias, so 1876 to 78, many militias, they're robbing local populations, and many Muslim refugees, many Circassians, they are part of those militias, right? And so during the war, the Ru Russia invades, Russian troops are moving across Romania, then across Bulgaria, towards the Ottoman capital, mm. and Circassian civilians, they flee following the retreat of the Ottoman army. They're terrified of staying in the Balkans because you know, they don't want to stay under Russian rule again. And they also, they fear the vengeance of the local populations because of the atrocities by those Muslim militias or Muslim you know, gangs that were roaming the countryside. So by the time the war ends, practically all Circassians are gone from the former Ottoman territories in the Balkans, mm. from Romania, Bulgaria, and Serbia. Yeah, it's, a, it's a so, so almost disheartening to think about that. 
they become double refugees. Yeah. And so in my book, I'm rewriting the history of refugee resettlement in the, in the Balkans for a long time, for over a century. The 19th century in Balkan, especially Bulgarian history, is remembered as the Turkish yoke, right? The last decades of Ottoman rule, when the Ottoman government and their Muslim militias unleashed violence against local populations, right? And I'm showing that, yes, Muslim refugees were responsible for a lot of that violence. Mm. In fact, I'm making a, an argument that Muslim refugee resettlement in the Balkans in the 1860s was such a disaster that it accelerated the expulsion of the Ottomans from the Balkans, from the territories that the Ottomans governed for about 500 years. Mm. But what interests me is how that violence came, come about, mm. right? So I look into the political economy of refugee resettlement. I look into Ottoman tax registers and Ottoman land registers. Refugees didn't turn to violence because they were fanatical, because they hated Christians, or because they loved the Ottoman Empire so mm -hmm. much. That violence was economic in nature. Mm. Like it was about inequality, and it was a, about a complete collapse of the refugee economies in the 1870s, mm. because those economies were not set up to succeed mm. by the government. Mm. Mm. So when they leave the Balkans in the 70s, they go to the Levant. Most of them go to Anatolia, okay. but then some of them go to the Levant, to modern day Syria and Jordan. So I don't want to get too far ahead, but I'm trying to think about this. You have a generation of, of folks that are going from their homeland, North Caucasus regions, very different. They're going to the Balkans. I don't think it's... I mean, it's different. I don't think it's, you know, it's not like they went from mountains to the beach necessarily, but, you know, like it is a different place, different terrain, different, you know. And then they're going to central Anatolia and then they're going to Levant. I mean, these are different places. I mean, these are completely different, different environment. environments, geography, different people groups. You there. have to grow different crops. Yeah, it's completely right, different. Right. And again, this isn't you get in your car and you just drive, you know, a couple of kilometers down the road or something. I mean, this is people that are, I'm assuming, walking maybe horses, yeah. maybe there's caravans, all these things, takes time, takes all these things. Like, that's, that's such a displacement of people in a generation it's or two. It's horrendous. So, so I'm thinking about the kind of the environmental dimension of this, the, also the agricultural uh -huh, dimension. Uh -huh. You don't have a security blanket here. Your first harvest cannot fail because if it does, your family dies mm -hmm. of starvation. And so you arrive in a new location. You need to quickly figure out like what you can sow there, right? And to collect your first harvest, it's, it's incredibly hard. And, and, and the death toll was unimaginable in the first couple of years after you know, every displacement. People were dying of hunger and people were dying of epidemic diseases. Mm. Like if you're settled in the, co like in the coastal, in the marshy areas, there was a lot of malaria mm -hmm. in many mm -hmm. places in the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so big topic here. Uh, we've, we've, you know, I, I, there's obviously many fascinating things about the Ottoman Empire. And uh, as is true of empires anywhere usually, there's slavery. Um, yes. and so w just tell us about the role of Ottoman slavery in 63, 65, you know, after the 63, 65 crisis and help me understand this. I mean, make sure I get this right. Mm -hmm. The Ottoman empire is saying for various reasons, maybe there's, you know, kind of, we help Muslims kind of nearby and that's our duty and okay. And, uh, but then there's the economic, we need numbers and taxes and, you know, we want to make sure we're still thriving. So there's this very, you know, open arms, welcoming, but then there's mm -hmm. also slavery here. So what's going on here? What, what, I mean, obviously there can be multiple things going on at once, but tell us about this kind of, ver or uh, this part of the story and the kind of dynamics of it. Right. So to add to all this tragedy that we've been discussing, right. slavery is also part of the story. Mm -hmm. And uh, about maybe 10%, maybe more of all refugees, especially Circassian refugees who are coming in, they are enslaved, right? They enslaved to other Circassians. So the Circassian refugee crisis of 1863-64, it sustained and it even strengthened the institution of Ottoman slavery. So here's a brief explanation. Ottoman slavery was a very racialized institution. 
enslaved black people and enslaved white people usually had different roles and different occupations in Ottoman society. By the early 19th century, the Ottoman Empire lost its historical supply of enslaved white people from the Caucasus, usually via Crimea. So the institution of white slavery was dying out at that point because there was no supply. The refugee crisis from the Caucasus in the 1860s changes all that. Mm. So there are hundreds of thousands of destitute refugees who are arriving in Ottoman ports. They're hungry, they're traumatized. Some of them are seized and sold into slavery by slave merchants. Sometimes upper status refugees would sell lower status refugees who were in some kind of servitude to them into slavery. So as a result of that, so many people, they arrive with people who are in servitude to them. Mm. So as a result of this immense supply, all of a sudden, the market of white slaves is bloated, right? Prices on enslaved Circassians collapse and the practice of owning an enslaved person becomes widespread, right? If in the past only the imperial harem or the top elites could afford Circassian slaves, now it becomes much more common among upper classes in the Ottoman Empire. So many more households all of a sudden get a stake in preserving this institution. So again, more context here. Slave trade was banned in the Ottoman Empire at that point right? Both of white slaves and black slaves by the mid-19th century. But slave ownership was never banned. So this institution survived until the very end of the empire. And then it survived informally, illegally, even a bit longer into the, into the 20th century. So, yeah. Okay. A few, few things there. <laughs> Tell me about the roles as, as, as much as you can or whatever about... Mm-hmm. I feel like many of the listeners are going to, we're going to know, we're going to have slavery as we understand it in an American context, right? Many people know that story. It it, it's, it's, it's uh, same time frame too, you know, 50, in the 1850s, exactly. you know, we, we know that story. So I imagine that my American listeners will kind of have that as a reference point and that may or may not be a good thing. So just kind of tell us, um, this broke down racially. You said black and white, and there were different roles. What were those different roles for black slaves and white slaves during this period? You said there were different roles that they had. What were the different mm-hmm. roles and why? What, what was the racial component here? So in the Ottoman Empire, many black slaves from Eastern Africa often, right, uh, would be in, uh, it would be agricultural slavery, right? Right. For many white slaves, it was household slavery, right? Where were the white and slaves also, coming from? Uh, historically, and at this point we're talking right, 15th, 16th century, either the Balkans or uh, uh, Crimea and the Caucasus, mm-hmm. okay. right? So households and harems. But again, this is a generalization. Sure, sure. Like uh, Ottoman slavery is, is incredibly complicated, and indeed it does not have the same... Um, vocabulary and the same kind of occupations that uh, slavery in the transatlantic context mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, has. It, uh, slavery in the Ottoman Empire was as brutal mm-hmm. right, and as dehumanizing, mm-hmm. of course, as any other kind of slavery. Sure, yeah. So in addition to Ottoman slavery, there's also North Caucasian slavery, slavery that was indig- um, in, that was practiced in those indigenous communities. Mm. And the context there was completely different from the Ottoman Empire, Mm. right? There, slavery was typically practiced within the same ethnic group. Mm. Like sometimes prisoners of war from another ethnic group would be enslaved, but usually the household slavery was within the same ethnic group. Mm. And so in the mid 19th century, all of that is transplanted into the Ottoman context. Many refugees arrive with people who are in servitude to them, but the Ottoman government doesn't quite realize this, Mm. right? And so when the resettlement happened throughout the empire, some of the refugee villages, they have um, some pretty brutal hierarchies going on because people stay in servitude to their enslavers. 
That's wild. Yeah. That's wild. So you're going <laughs> to, that's, that's a kind of a sort of a hard thing, I guess, to wrap my head around for a minute. And there's a legacy of that in the 20th and 21st century, because as people keep living in those villages, after slavery is abolished, of course, the memories of slavery, that legacy remains, right? And so it informs how people behave towards each other mm. and whether there's intermarriage mm. and all kinds of things, as you imagine. Mm. It's a very sensitive issue um, in the North Caucasian diaspora, right? There's a lot of... Mm. Uh, there's a lot of shame and there's a lot of soul searching happening right now, mm. right? As people, as many activists, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Circassian activists talk about it more and more. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, just on the, on the, on the, on the face of it, to, 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 to be within your own ethnic group, let's say, or even a nearby ethnic group, uh, nearby me and regionally to, to be enslaved. And then to be displaced, both the person that enslaves you and you yourself, you go to a new place and still have the slavery in a new place. That's that's like right. that's like that's like layers of like uh, trauma. That's that's wild. That's super wild to think about. That's that's crazy. And there are also different categories of enslavement within different North Caucasian communities, mm. right? So some of those categories they would be more similar to. Russian serfdom, right? Where you perform a certain amount of um, agricultural labor, mm. right? For essentially a person who enslaves mm-hmm. you, right? Where some forms, they would be more similar to, um, to transatlantic, to plantation slavery, mm. where the enslaver like fully owns your labor mm. and your body. Mm. So again, and those different categories, they're transplanted into this diasporic world, but the Ottomans don't know how to deal with all this mm. because they're not familiar yeah, with those yeah. categories. And they have to rely on their interlocutors who usually are the upper status yeah. people who will be enslavers to translate all of this. So you can see how uh, a lot of abuse can Absolutely. happen in this situation. Yeah, that's, wow. Mm. The Ottomans were also in a, you know, they were facing, there's this dilemma that were, they were navigating two positions that were irreconcilable. They, the government was the arbiter of justice, let's say. So whenever there was a conflict between enslaved people and slaveholders, and there were many, there were slave revolts um, on, on a smaller scale, the slaveholders would appeal to the government to uphold Ottoman laws because, look, slavery is legal in the Ottoman Empire, Mm. right? And then enslaved people would also appeal to the government seeking manumission or release from enslavement, right? And the authorities were trying to defuse the situation, maybe secure manumission, maybe, you know, pay the slaveholder. But ultimately, the government usually upheld the status quo and backed slaveholders. Now, let's bring it all back to refugee migration, yeah, refugee yeah. regime. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so it was even more complicated because they were all muhajirs, right? They were all refugees that made for a legal mess. The government recognized every immigrating Muslim from the Caucasus as muhajir. And as a muhajir, they had the right to free land, to exemptions, to subsidies in accordance with the 1857 um, Ottoman immigration law. but the government also recognized slavery, right? And therefore, it upheld the right of uh, some people to own other peoples, of some muhajirs to own other muhajirs. This tension was never resolved Mm. by the government. The government essentially turned a blind eye. Technically, every refugee had rights guaranteed by Ottoman law. In practice, Circassians, some Circassians arrived enslaved to other Circassians and they never got any rights, right? They didn't get free land. They didn't get exemptions. Their enslavers took it all and they continued to benefit, uh, you know, from their labor. Yeah, that is, uh, I'll be very honest. Uh, hearing all this spelled out is, it's almost a lot to take in. There, there's layers and layers and layers of like, just a kind of torment. I mean that that's that's horrific. I mean that's we're just talking about generations of, I mean within own people and then and then a, 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 you know different people groups in a new place. Um, yeah, that's that is. A, it is it is a very violent story. Yeah, that's a, that's a that's a brutal story. My goodness. 
Hmm. So there's, so, I mean, that's a very, I'm sure there's lots of research on Ottoman slavery and all these things as well. So I'm sure there's, you know, much, much uh, ink spilled on that, which is, uh, it sounds like it's still a kind of a reckoning is happening. People are still trying to figure out, you know, put all the pieces together and see what's still going on and all that. So that sounds like that's a very kind of evolving uh, kind of a way of looking at it. I would recommend the work of Jada Karamursa uh-huh. in English, who writes about nice. kind of slavery and how it tra- transforms in the 19th century. Mm. And uh, for your listeners who, who read in Turkish, Elbrus Aksoy mm. has a new book uh, precisely about Circassian slavery and memories of it. Today. Oh, that's great. Yeah, thanks for, for mentioning those folks, for sure. So with the... Um, you give these four reasons, these four interconnected reasons for the failing of refugee uh, economies. You say a uh, global demand for Ottoman grain declined, the drought in the Balkans, uh, debt to European states, expiring tax exemptions for Circassian um, Muhajirs. So what, what <laughs> I guess the big question here is in the 1870s, was this just a bad time, wrong place, just <laughs> Just an awful constellation of issues for refugees. You got all this stuff happening within their ethnic group and 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 then outside of it. Then they come to a place that's got their own issues going on. Is this just like a just a bad batch of variables all at once, or what? What was the idea of these reasons for the refugee economies to fail? Yes, 1870s was a <laughs> terrible time, and it was a wrong place, yeah. right? So there are two main reasons why resettlement failed so badly in the Balkans, right? And why it came to an end, and then there was so much violence. Mm. First is the issue of funding. The Ottomans didn't have the money to properly fund resettlement. They spent a lot of money on transporting people from ports to their new places of settlement, and then they spent some money on helping them to build houses, give them some grain, but then the state leaves, right? And refugees are left to fend for themselves. And it doesn't work this way, right? People need more support to stand on their feet. And and here we're also talking about people who are survivors of an ethnic cleansing in the Caucasus, Mm -hmm. right? Tremendous violence. So by the early 1870s, refugees' tax exemptions also expire. So now they have to start paying taxes to the state, but they barely grow enough to support themselves. And then the drought comes in the early 1870s. So the refugees lose their harvest. They're starving, and they cannot expect any emergency aid from the Ottoman government because the state is not getting enough taxes, so it's getting bankrupt. Mm. In 1875, the Ottoman state defaults on its obligations, mm. right? And it's uh, to European lenders, and it's effectively bankrupt. Mm. The economy unravels, and many refugees, to survive, they, they turn to banditry, they join irregular militias, and yes, they plunder local populations often, usually, usually Christians in the Balkans. Mm. So that's number one. The second reason is political for, for, the, uh, for why it and everything ended so badly. It's the age of national movements in the Balkans. Mm. Bulgarians won their independence, and the Ottoman government instead settled several hundred thousand Muslim refugees who are dependent on the government and are likely to back Istanbul should there be a Bulgarian war of independence. So this can only be interpreted by many Bulgarians as a plot to change demographics and strengthen Ottoman rule. Meanwhile, the Bulgarian populations, they lose their land to refugees. Sometimes they have to build houses for them. So in these circumstances, the resettlement is effectively doomed. Refugees are dropped into a sectarian environment, Mm. which is not of their doing, Mm. and it shouldn't be a surprise that things end badly. Mm. But I do want to say that this story, it also, like, it complicates the narrative, right? The, this, these refugees, they were victims. They were victims of Russian colonialism. They were survivors of, you know, horrors uh, of the ethnic cleansing. But from the perspective of others in the Ottoman Empire, uh, let's say Bulgarians and Greeks, and also in some places Armenians and Kurds um, and Turks and Druze, Right, and Arabs, they were settlers who came in and who took their land. And the government gave them that land and sometimes even militarily backed them up against local populations. Yeah. So it, it complicates how we understand refugee resettlement. It, 
it, it just sounds like a terrible time. It sounds like a terrible, 1870s were a terrible time for a lot of people, including uh, the refugees from the North Caucasus regions. It sounds terrible. So when we think about colonization of the West, for example, in North America, mm -hmm. it's a very similar story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, like, and of course, in many other like settler colonial mm -hmm, mm -hmm, contexts, mm -hmm. the displacement of local populations yeah. and the state promoted settler colonialism. Right, so yes, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely, for sure, for sure. So uh, let's. I'll set it up kind of generally, and then we can talk about mm -hmm. specifically one 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 particular region. But um, you talk about how the. Circassians, they settle in Syria. There's, a, there's obviously many in, mm -hmm. in Turkey, modern day Turkey, but there's a, there's a bunch in Syria uh, as early as 1859. And there's five clusters in the Ottoman Levant, uh, which is Amman and Transjordan. We'll come back to that in a minute. Golan mm -hmm. Heights, uh, Damascus, Homs, uh, and Hama, and Jazeera. So kind of give us the, the kind of landscape of. Mm, why this region of Syria in particular, these regions, mm -hmm. I should say, excuse me, in, in Syria. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I mean, obviously Damascus is a, is a very um, uh, mm -hmm. ancient city. It's a, it's a big, big city. Maybe tell us about the four, Golan Heights, Damascus, Homs, Hama, right. and Jazeera. And then, and then we'll come to Amman because you, you already mentioned it earlier and there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, uh, 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 roots planted there in Amman. So tell us about these other four. I guess generally why the five regions, but these other four. Right. So there are references to early Circassian villages in Syria as early as the 1850s. We don't really know much about those villages. Uh, those refugees likely came over land, not by sea. But much of the settlement happens after 1878. So many of those refugees are refugees from the Balkans, right? So they're double refugees. Yeah. Um, and... So there are several clusters of villages. If you think right about all these places, the Golan Heights, uh, areas around Damascus, Homs and Hama, and Jazeera. Jazeera is northeastern Syria, right, very close to the Iraqi border. What unites all of them is that they're not on the coast, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. They are on the so-called nomadic frontier. They are around the edge of the Syrian desert. Mm. So essentially, they separate the territories that are already settled, sometimes densely settled, agriculturally fertile populations to the west where people are sedentary, right? And it separates those lands from, um, from the desert or semi-desert to the east, which is the land of the Bedouin, uh, which are nomadic populations. Mm -hmm. And the Ottomans, they're doing this very much on purpose. They, they hope that the refugees would actually settle on that nomadic frontier and they stay there. Mm. They encourage them to settle there to expand agricultural production eastward. They want more lands to become productive and produce more grain. The government also wants to kind of push its sovereignty into the nomadic te territories, mm. right? And to expand state control over the nomads' lands. Mm. It wants to increase travel security in the region, thinking that the refugees would be, you know, law obedient and would cooperate with the Ottoman state. And they largely did. Mm. But ultimately, it's about enforcing and promoting taxation, not only among refugees, but also among people who live around refugees, mm. including nomads and local peasants. Mm. The idea was that the refugees come, they register the land in their name, mm. and they start paying taxes on that land. And other communities, not to lose any more land to the refugees, they would do the same thing. Mm. They would start registering, and they would actually start paying taxes to the Ottoman government. Mm. So that's the, mm. that's so the it, Ottoman So, so it's very strategic. Sounds like it's very strategic in, 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 in placing folks here. Ottoman se settlement was generally quite strategic, mm. especially after 1878. Mm. So that is one big strategy. Another big strategy right, is um, in Anatolia. Mm. It's, um, it's the sectarian strategy. Mm. So at that point, there were few North Caucasians coming in, right? Like, let's say 1880s, 1890s, it was refugees from the Balkans. Um, but the Ottomans were intentionally settling people in Christian majority areas. Uh, for example, in Western Anatolia, where there were Greek populations, mm. um, Central and Eastern Anatolia, where there were Armenian populations, precisely to increase the share of the Muslim population. Mm. Um, 
on whom the government thought it could rely mm. in case there was any kind of uprising. Mm. So the sectarian dimension is big and it's getting bigger and bigger all the way towards um, the Armenian genocide. Mm. Mm. I'll come back to Anatoly in a minute. So, so, so Aman, Jordan, so you mentioned it earlier, big central place for Circassian refugees. In fact, it was a, a, a village established as a, as a Circassian village in 78. Um, and that there's these interesting, I, you mentioned in the book, and it, was, it was very fascinating. There's these kind of waves of migration here. So Circassians in 1912, Armenians, 1915, 1922, Palestinians in 48 and 67, Iraqis after 03, Syrians after 2011. So this, this becomes like a, like a kind of a, a shining light on a hill of sorts for folks that are displaced, it seems like, right? You're seeing a lot of people coming there. Why did they choose, Circassians choose Amman as, as the kind of central place? And why does it persist as a kind of beacon for, for refugees until today, until, until today? So Amman was indeed founded as a Circassian refugee village in 1878. And it's really a quintessential story of refugee success, right? They arrive in this pretty harsh environment on the edge of the Syrian desert. They survive there. They eventually build a village. Then within a generation, they transform that village into an boom, Ottoman boomtown on the nomadic frontier. We don't know how people arrived in Amman. We have records of people already being there for a couple of months. And we know that people were surviving in quite literally the caves in the area and in the ruins of the Roman theater. Now, if you go to Amman as a tourist, the Roman theater, right, it's, it, it's still very much there. Um, so over the last 150 years, Amman became a city built up by refugees, right? So Circassians, then Armenians who fled the genocide. It's, it, it was a fairly small Armenian community uh, who made it to Amman. But then there were Palestinians fleeing Nakba or catastrophe in 1948 and 67. And today, uh, Palestinians are a majority of the population, of the Jordanian population. And then the Iraqis fleeing, flee, fleeing the US invasion and Syrians fleeing the civil war. So I don't think it's necessarily because of Amman as a city mm. and of its location that it became this massive refugee hub, right? It is rather about Jordan as a country, right? And the, the mind boggling stability of Jordan, mm -hmm. which owes to very strategic decisions made by the Jordanian monarchy and Jordanian governments over the years. Mm. So Jordan, compared to many, to other countries in the Levant, it wasn't really set up for success mm. after World War I, mm. right? In terms of its location, its economy, its natural resources, um, its populations, its relations to, um, to the ruling family, it was very poorly set up as a state by the British colonial authorities. And yet, for many reasons, it became a safe haven mm. for many people who needed refuge. So in global history, it's a remarkable case. Today, the largest city in the Levant is Amman. And the Levant is a city, is a region with some of the world's oldest cities in history, mm -hmm. right? There's Damascus there, mm -hmm. there's Aleppo, right? There's, there's Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And yet it is Amman today mm -hmm. because, of, because of refugee migration, mm -hmm. right? Uh, meanwhile, Jordan is again kind of this unique case study. The majority of the population descends from refugees of the 20th century, mm. the Palestinians of the Nagba. So Jordan is a remarkable place. Mm. Yeah, it's just very, very interesting. And, and still, I mean, it's obviously persists today. I think, is it the capital of Jordan? Am I right on this? I think that's right. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously a big hub. Um, Okay, so, and it became a capital of Jordan uh, when Circassians were still the majority of the population. So uh, there are accounts that in the 1920s, the, when it already was a capital, right, of this new nation state, um, Circassian was the main language on the streets, mm. right? It only flipped later, of course, with more immigration mm. from the rest of Jordan mm -hmm. when, you know, Arabic became the dominant language mm -hmm. in Amman. But it's just, it's, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I guess the, you kind of break up the book into these kind of big chapters. Basically, the Balkans, mm -hmm. uh, the Levant, and then Anatolia, right? So obviously, as we've already said at different points, you know, Anatolia has such a rich history. It's a long history. Um, why was Central Ottoman Anatolia 
a destination for North Caucasus uh, refugees. Mm-hmm. What was it? You know, the Ottomans are putting refugees in different places. What was it in this area, in kind of central Anatolia, that they 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 placed them there for? And and how does Circassian culture still persist today in this region, uh, uh, as as we see in even in modern times? So most North Caucasian refugees ended up in Anatolia, right? It was close enough to the Caucasus, and there was so much land that the Ottomans, you know, were prioritizing Anatolia for resettlement. Uh, So many North Caucasians now live around the cities of Bandarma, Duzje, Eskishahir, Sino, Samsun, Mush, Sarakamish, Yalova. Um, But yes, central Anatolia was one of the big hubs, and in my book, I'm looking at, uh, at the region of Uzunyayla. So let me describe yeah. it. Uzunyayla means long plateau mm-hmm. in Turkish, mm-hmm. and it's remarkable. <laughs> it lies at over 5,000 feet above sea level, and it's pretty much in the center of Anatolia, mm-hmm. right? On all four sides, it's surrounded by mountains, mm-hmm. right? And there's only one way to, to leave that mountain valley. It's um, a small opening, and the river like keeps is escaping from that following and then flows mm. all the way down to Chukurova or Kilikia and flows into the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, so have, by the 18th century... Sorry, have, have uh-huh. you been there yourself? Have you been there to, to this region? Or? I have. Oh, I love this place it's beautiful. so much. It's absolutely incredible. Oh, it is also, it's, it's a pretty harsh environment. Mm. In winter, it's completely snowy. Mm. So there's no communication between villages. It's, mm. you, it's a harsh environment to survive. Mm. But that's what attracted refugees because... The mountaineers, right, people from the mountains, they knew that they could survive mm-hmm. somewhere like that. And apparently the environment there is similar to Kabarda mm. in the north central Caucasus. Mm. So most refugees there were Kabardians. But by the 1860s, there were 40,000 North Caucasian refugees wow. all on that mountain, wow. Wow. in that mountain valley, on that plateau. Wow. And they were pretty much alone. Mm. Um, So it was one of the largest places of resettlement in the Ottoman Empire. And it was popular because it was isolated. Refugees knew that they could preserve their culture there. And also they wanted to be left left alone, Mm -hmm. essentially. So uh, it it is known until today within the diaspora as Kushuk Kafkasia or the Little Caucasus. Mm. Because Caucasus, its culture was pretty much recreated Mm -hmm. in that mountain valley. There were... Uh, different groups of Circassians, mm-hmm. including Kabardians. Uh, there were Ossetians, Chechens, Karachais, and, and Abazins. So, um, and for many of them, these refugees kind of got to meet each other for the first time in exile, in diaspora, right? And they recreated small Caucasus there. So there were over 70 villages. Wow. And today, about 60 North Caucasian villages remain. Uh, they're no longer alone in that region. They're uh, Turkish villages. Um, the Turkish villages, they're descendants of the Afshar nomads who were expelled by Cir- Circassians, essentially. There was a conflict in the 1860s for the control of the valley. So again, speaking of the refugee versus the settler um, dichotomy. And there are also Kurdish immigrants in that valley. But it's one of the few places in the Middle East where native languages of the Caucasus um, especially Circassian dialects, they survive to a certain extent, even among the young people, which is incredibly rare yeah. elsewhere, yeah. right? But because it's in such isol- it's so isolated, which is what allowed it to become the small Caucasus, it is now an economic decline because of yeah. it. The population of Uzunyayla today, or of the North Caucasian population of Uzunyayla, is smaller than it was a century ago. Young people are leaving the area. Right? There's so few economic opportunities. People go to Ankara, to Kayseri, to Istanbul, maybe to Germany. And so this isolation, which allowed it to be such a safe haven, it is now endangering the preservation of North Caucasian culture there. Mm, mm. I, I want to come back to this uh, in, a, in a minute, uh, but uh, something about the kind of interaction there. I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But so... As, as you get to the kind of the end of the book and, and kind of how things are kind of, you know, in, in kind of uh, closer to modernity here, the general question here is, is how did North Caucasians, as they were spread over the Ottoman Empire, 
How did they, each ethnic group, as we talked about in the very beginning, all these different ethnic groups, even within Circassian culture, there's all these different sub-communities. How did they maintain their own social hierarchy? How did they maintain their distinct sets of social and legal practices and kind of their unwritten moral codes within the Ottoman kind of practices? How did they maintain that? So people try to live close by, right? There were networks of ethnic villages, of ethnic Circassian and Ossetian and Chechen villages throughout the empire. And people tried to do everything they can to settle next to their ethnic kin. And those who managed to do it, well, they preserved their language and traditions for longer than people who ended up alone, settled somewhere far away. So Uzunyayla really is a prime example here. Because there's so many North Caucasian villages, Right. And because there were no outsiders, right, people really got to, you know, speak their native languages all the way into the late 20th century. Mm. But in terms of the social hierarchies, things inevitably change in exile. And this really is a story of any diaspora, sure. right? Yeah. The, the social orders, they get looser, more flexible, because that is necessary for the diaspora to survive. So, for example, in exile, in diaspora, North Caucasian refugees started marrying people from different ethnic groups, mm -hmm. but they had a preference for someone from the Caucasus, right? So there was a lot of intermarriage between Circassians and Ossetians mm -hmm. and Abkhazians and Chechens. Because if you can't find another Circassian nearby, it's, it's better to intermarry with a family, at least from the Caucasus, mm -hmm. right? Who would know some of your traditions. Mm -hmm. Social classes were shifting too, because many elites were so impoverished Right? They couldn't reinforce those old hierarchies. And so distinctions between nobility and non-nobility were not as important as they used to be. But some things didn't change. And I already mentioned this. The descendants of enslaved people and descendants of, let's say, free peasants right, from the same ethnic group, uh, you know, they, there's, there's relatively little intermarriage. Right? So some biases remain right within those communities mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's very interesting how you can you can you can almost you know as you're describing it feel like you want to preserve culture and heritage but that becomes increased if you're very small and your diaspora it becomes increasingly more difficult as time goes on um now I, i'm curious about so this was what i was going to ask how uh, you can get more current day i guess with this mm -hmm. I'm assuming, let's, let's think, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to generalize, but um, let's say for, for Turks, right? For, for, for Turkish people. And again, there's a kind of you know, a dialogue about what that means and you know, how, how do we see Turkish people. Mm -hmm. but for, for the Turks, how did they, what are some of the ideas or views? I'm sure some were welcoming of, of some of these of different people from different places and ethnic groups, but maybe there's resistance too of, a lot of people are coming into Turkey or they have come into Turkey. Is there a kind of general sentiment of, you know, acceptance and how do we maintain and cohabitate together? Or is there some resistance here or does that ebb and flow throughout the 20th and into 21st century? Just generally, what's the kind of pulse of interactions between different ethnic groups, um, you know, throughout, I guess, Turkey specifically? Um. I mean, throughout the 20th century, there was a lot of assimilation, mm. right, for North Caucasians into, into the Turkish society. Mm. We also have to be cognizant of the fact that between 1923, the establishment of the Turkish Republic, mm. and the 1950s, you could not publicly say that you were not a Turk, mm. right? So those identities, mm -hmm. non-Turkish, non-Turkic identities, they were essentially outlawed, mm. right? And so there, there's a lot of trauma, like, from those generations sure. uh, for, for many North Caucasians. But in terms of immigration and Turkish attitudes, I mean, for the late Ottoman period, it really does seem that, generally speaking, that it, it was a pretty welcoming attitude, mm. right? People knew that those people are escaping the worst things yeah. and, you know, yeah. they wanted to help. When you look at the local level, of course, there was competition over land and resources, sure. like it is with any kind of immigration, yeah. right? So there... Of course, there were all kinds of grievances, like the court records. If you go into court records for any district, oh, wild, wild stories, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There wasn't necessarily an explicit ethnic dimension there, but it's more about 
us versus settled versus them newcomers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, what's happening in Turkey now, you know, immigration in the 21st century, I think it's a completely different conversation. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and I mean, we do have to keep in mind that there's a, that there's a, I think there's a, a lot of a racial aspect, mm. right? And, um, and races, right, when it comes to the treatment of people who are immigrating from Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria in, in Turkey now. So there's mm-hmm. kind of like that ugly face, mm-hmm. just like there's so much racism in um, immigration debates in Europe and the United States. Oh, yeah, oh, for sure, for sure, so for sure, yeah, absolutely. I guess kind of going towards at the end there, uh, I don't know if you if you, you know him or familiar, I had a wonderful conversation with uh, Adam Mishtayan, who wrote... Um, uh-huh. Modern Arab Kingship. Is that the right title? I think that's that's yes. close enough. Something like that. <laughs> uh-huh. And we had a really nice conversation. Uh, he's he was he was wonderful. He's brilliant. And he has this term he uses in the book. I don't know if it's his term specifically, but he uses in the book of this kind of mm-hmm. recycling empire of you know mm. post Ottoman Empire. Yeah, is you really get a lot of these nation states. You know, he gives the example of. Right. He spends a lot of time talking about Syria and the kind of brief kingdom of Syria there in the twenties, nineteen twenties. He talks about Egypt and he talks about uh, different, different, different kind of nation states. Mm-hmm. But this idea of okay, yeah, 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 we're not going to have empire anymore. You're going to have we're going to draw lines on a map and have these nation states. But really, at least in most of the twentieth century, we're going to still kind of operate sort of in a sense of how empire mm-hmm. is. And so, I guess. Is there, you, you talk, you've mentioned this at different points, and I'm sure there's a lot of different forces of this. There is, a, there is an assimilation that is happening late Ottoman into the 20th century for many uh, ethnic groups from the North Caucasus regions. And again, at this mm-hmm. point, there's probably at least a generation or so since the initial migration. So h- how is it in terms of where... Uh, generations of, of refugees from the North Caucasus region, how have they kind of coalesced around or have they coalesced around more of kind of the nation state or a kind of you know, type of nationalism of like, well, I've, you know, my parents and grandparents have been mm-hmm. in Turkey or they've been in Jordan for two or three generations. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm uh, Turkish as opposed to Circassian now. Mm-hmm. What's the kind of, um, or is it just kind of like, yeah, historically, I guess generally as we keep going through time, and maybe this isn't necessarily specific to this diaspora, many diasporas have this kind of conversation, but what's the kind of, again, similar thing, temperature about post-Ottoman, you know, as we kind of look at nation states as opposed to empire or anything else, where do these ideas of identity kind of play out in terms of maintaining whether it's Circassian or other forms, or I guess, how are people looking at identity, generally speaking, uh, when, when you're in these different places? So I'll try to kind of like generalize things a little sure. bit, but at the same time, I want to say that there's so much nuance to sure, it sure. because the diaspora, the political ideologies in diaspora were so different, mm. right? And left wing and right wing and religious, it's, it's, it's all over the map. But the main goal of the North Caucasian diaspora in the 20th century was to survive. It was to preserve its culture and not to fully assimilate into Turkishness and Arabness, Mm. right? And to preserve their languages as well as they could. Mm. In every place where North Caucasians ended up, their leadership tried to maintain good relations with the ruling regime, right? And this is, I think, that's what I'm arguing in the book. It's one of the lessons they learned Mm. from the Ottoman Empire. That It's very important to have a good relationship with the state when you're a minority, right? And when you're dropped in a completely different new political environment. So in Syria and Jordan, many Circassians are remarkably well integrated, Mm. right? Uh, In the society, and many are quite well represented in the military and the security apparatus. Mm. Again, something that stems all the way from the late Ottoman period and the policies that the Ottoman government was uh, was pursuing. Uh, And in every country in the Middle East, North Caucasians were very careful throughout the 20th century to assert their patriotism, right, as an ethno-linguistic minority. And again, this is a survival mechanism, right? So we are Jordanian citizens first, Mm but we're also a culturally Circassian, right? Or we're part of the multi-ethnic Syrian nation and Chechen is our language at home. Mm. 
So the, there's patriotism to the nation state, right? And the solidarity with the dominant ethnic group, that's a big part of, of, of the diasporic identity mm. in the region. And I mentioned that in Turkey, it, it, it was quite different because people couldn't really publicly speak about who they are until the 1950s, but things changed uh, you know, since then. And if anything, I would say that in the last 15 years, it's kind of a cultural revival of sorts within the diaspora, right? There are kind of new publications. There's a great interest uh, since the end of the Cold War mm. about what is happening in the Caucasus. There was a lot of, um, there's a, some migration back and forth as tourists. Uh, some people even try to go back to the Caucasus and stay. So there's also an interest in what's happening in the Caucasus. And that's also changing how the North Caucasian diaspora in the Middle East thinks about itself. Mm, yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, I was going to ask about that. Is Was there every a, a time you mentioned in the book of, you know, reasons that maybe some North uh, Caucasians were able to return to their original homeland, you know, kind of in Russia or, or adjacent to it? And um, has that have we seen evidence of that at different points post-Ottoman in the 20th, 21st century of people trying to, as you're saying now, you know, kind of going back to, kind of the original homeland of, of, you know, Circassia, what it looks like, you know, um, um, maybe different today, but that region, do, do we see any return back to kind of the, the, the homeland of sorts in, in, in a big way, or, or is it just too difficult or it's too far removed or what, what do we mm-hmm. see with that? So there was a ban, right? Back in the Imperial period in 1861, the Russian military banned North Caucasian Muslims who had left uh, from returning to the Caucasus. And the striking thing is that this ban was never really revoked. Like it, mm. it remained, like we can think about it as, as kind of continuing, yeah. right? Because neither the Russian Empire, nor the Soviet Union, nor the Russian Federation ever recognized the right of return for descendants of refugees who had fled the Caucasus in the 19th century. So in the imperial period, I estimate that up to 40,000 Muslims actually managed to return, but it was pretty much an unauthorized return that was maybe okayed by some authorities, Russian authorities later. But generally there was a ban. Mm. Um, So I was recently doing research on this and throughout the 20th century, there were many attempts, right? In the 1930s and 60s and 70s, Circassians from Turkey, Syria, and Jordan kept sending petitions to the Soviet government asking for their readmission, Mm. right? But the government never recognized the mass right of return. Since the end of the Cold War, with the establishment of the Russian Federation, um, things changed. People can immigrate as individuals, but they're treated as um, regular foreigners, right? Mm. Who are immigrating in Russia, Mm. right? So there's no reference to them being a diaspora, them having ancestral link uh, to, to that country. So that has been a source of, um, of grievances, mm. of course, mm. in the diaspora. Yeah, I'm sure. For, absolutely. I can see that for, for sure. That's, that's, that's wild to think about it that way. So my last question for you is uh, we've, mm-hmm. we've looked at this history of, you know, North Caucasian Muslim refugees, late Ottoman Empire, um, and I guess just kind of Currently today, how do we continue to see those ripple effects of migrations for the ethnic makeup of Turkey and Syria and other countries in the region? And how does this understanding this, you know, for, for listeners that are hearing about all of these things and these, you know, various you know, ethnic groups and migrations, how does this help inform us about how we should or could handle uh, refugees in today's society and, and, and mm-hmm. in the same region, right? So that way we're, we're there's always going to be, uh, uh, horrific things that are happening from you know horrific players. Uh, how do we how do how do we uh, how can we do a better job of, of of making sure these types of things don't continue happening? Um, and uh, yeah, some of the, the the pieces that are going on for for us today and in, in the world. Right. Thank you. So, in terms of the impact of 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 this nineteenth century migration, I mean the impact on demographics is massive, right? In terms of numbers. By World War I, North Caucasians was, were anywhere up to 5% of the population, right, in some regions. So 
a massive diaspora in Turkey, the second largest ethnic minority after the Kurds. Uh, you know, the founders of three of the four largest cities in Jordan, right? Massive impact on both Jordan and Syria. Uh, North Caucasians are an important part of the fabric of Middle Eastern societies. Now, in terms of um, kind of the infrastructure, the Ottoman refugee regime, it didn't go away, right? When the empire collapsed, the new nation states, they inherited that legislation, they inherited those administrators, the bureaucrats who were administering those laws. So all that know-how remained. And so throughout the 20th centuries, century, laws changed, of course, but you know, some legacy of the Ottoman refugee regime remains. How does it help inform refugee policy today is, is, a, is a difficult question to answer because historical circumstances matter a great deal. And the world today is very different from the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century. So how the Ottomans built their refugee regime is very historically specific. I think that we as human beings have a moral obligation to help those who are in need. And our states should be maximally open to people fleeing violence, escaping to save their lives. I think here's one lesson that I think we can learn from Empire of Refugees. The state support for refugees is absolutely critical for refugees to thrive in their new country. If the state welcomes refugees, it is not enough to admit people. Like the state should have legislation and infrastructure dedicated to refugee resettlement and welfare. The state should help with housing and work, provide some kind of financial support for refugees to join the labor force and education and become self sufficient. Letting people in and then abandoning them, therefore condemning them to a cycle of poverty in generations, that's, that's not ethical. And I, it's also not a good economic policy. Yet that's what often happens. Because economic planning, when it comes to immigration, when it comes to refugee resettlement, is often short term. That's how elected governments and non-elected governments are usually thinking, short term. A good refugee policy requires a long-term commitment of support and integration for refugees to be able to rebuild their lives and actually thrive in their new society. That's very nicely said, I, and I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think that as, as we can see throughout this conversation and your, your wonderful book uh, is that land and territory is always um, moving and peoples inhabit different lands at different times. And, and, um, I think we need to be, you know, honest and balanced and, uh, about how, how we're, how we're treating people and how we're treating people and big groups of people and, um, being able to, you know, learn from, from, from lessons of history. And, uh, if we don't, unfortunately we just repeat all the bad ones. And so I think, uh, your book is super instructive for, 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 for telling us about, um, many, many, uh, ethnic groups and peoples from the North Caucasus region and how they inhabit the, the world today in different, uh, current nation states and many, many, many wonderful lessons to, to, to kind of glean from this. Um, Vladimir, this was so much fun. I, I had anticipated your, your book. I really enjoyed your book. And I can uh, confidently say that I enjoyed the conversation with you the most. Uh, you, were, you were very, very wonderful. And I appreciate you giving me all of your time, your energy, and your knowledge. Uh, it's, a, it's a big, big uh, honor. So uh, I appreciate you taking the time here today. Xavier, thank you so much. It was, it was really a joy. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah.